Yes, 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 who got brands talking? Brandlife.co.za Good day, welcome to the weekly. My name is Sam Marshall, and as you know, every week we talk to uh, author extraordinaire, somebody who is uh, changing the game in the landscape, or you know, just some interesting people that play in the periphery of uh, the world of words. This morning, I'm speaking to somebody who's quite famous, actually. Um, the only thing she doesn't have is bodyguards and everything else. But uh, whenever you go to her store in uh, Malville, uh, called Love Books. You always, um, oh, well, I observed how people revere her and how they stare at her as if uh, she's the Kim Kardashian of books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm speaking to Kate Rogan, who's the author of Love Books. Kate, thank you very much for joining me. It's I don't a know if you, I don't know if you're a fan of Kim Kardashian. That might be an insult. I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm not really a fan. I've never <laughs> okay. watched that stuff. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you're the celebrity but in the same place. Yeah. Yes, thank um, you. So before we even talk about your love for books, I've got to I've got to find out about this uh, this name Love Books because you know just occasionally you stumble across a really cool name and I thought it's a really cool name. Oh well, I'm glad you think it's a really cool name. Um, I suppose it all happened when obviously when we were thinking about a name for the shop, um, and it was meant to actually be Heart Books, as in I Heart N Y. But that all got too complicated when it came to um, designing the logo, and there were considerations like articles in magazines. It, they would never have been able to put in the Heart Books. It all just becomes too complicated, and it just became Love Books. And I suppose Love Books came from just wanting to create an environment where people felt welcomed, warmed, get away from the the stuffiness and the exclusivity that sometimes surrounds books. I think those barriers have broken down a lot in the last 10 years. Mm. But um, I think books in the past in South Africa, it was quite a stuffy, snobby environment at times. Where were you? What were you doing? What were you thinking when you said, I'm going to open up a bookstore? Okay, so I've been in books all my life. I did an English degree. Um, I worked for a publisher. I worked for Strake, which was an, a little publisher called Southern Books. Mm. Um, and then I ended up at 702, actually, working for Jenny Chris Williams and producing the book show there. So I've been coming at books from a whole lot of different angles for a long time. Um, and then a friend of mine actually had a, a shop in the Bamboo Centre that's no longer there, and she knew that the existing space was coming up for rent. There was a wine shop there, and in fact, some people still walk into the shop and say, <laughs> where's the wine shop? And it's eight years later. Um, and she knew nothing about books, but she had the idea, and she approached me, and that's where it all began. And I, I took the leap. Yeah, it was time for me to move on. Um, my children were starting to get a little bit bigger, although they gave me a very hard time about going into such an all-consuming thing. Um, and that's where it started. Yeah. So I think you were really clever. You found a way to continue this love affair with books. Yeah. But then as a first-time uh, attendee of Love Books, I was blown away at how you, and I don't know how you've, the formula, but you found a space that not only gets to sell books, but as warm, it's comfortable it's social and i normally find especially and i i won't mention any bigger bookstores but i find them quite anti-social in a way mm -hmm. and you have found a, a way and have created a space where people kind of you bump into each other and you have to greet each other and am i wrong no 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 it's a very social space and we constant there are regulars that are there all the time they are authors that are there all the time and as you know sam we have a lot of launches and i think the launches are critical to the success mm. of the shop. Not only do they bring people to the shop who might never have heard of it, might never have been there before, but they somehow play a role in keeping it alive. It just, it keeps the place moving. You know, when you go on holiday and you leave your house and you come back, it feels like it's dead because there's been no one in it for, for two weeks or something. Well, I think book launches keep the place alive for us. They bring mm. the community there. It's a place where people can exchange ideas, talk about words, enjoy beautiful writing, meet their favorite author. Um, and it's very linked to the community in that way. Um, and that's also, yeah, I suppose it, that's why it is so, so lively. Um, there are a lot of familiar people there. And I suppose also independent bookshops by nature are warm, inviting, cozy places. So there's a couple of things throughout this conversation today we're going we're gonna to touch on. So I want to talk to you about your family. I want to talk okay. to you about the industry. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to just talk to you about um, 
the trend in books because I think that is something we don't often talk about. But there's a trend in books, you know. Some books do incredibly well, others don't do very, very well. But let's talk more about the store. Um, so you have this background. You used to work in radio. Um, you've now decided that I want to open up a bookstore. Um, your kids are for it, against it, in, in, in whatever way. <laughs> You'll explain it to us a little bit later. But when was when was was it scary though? Was it scary to because when you work for a radio station, that's a regular paycheck. When you work for somebody or you do something that's consistent, it's a regular paycheck. Now you're going into something that's uncertain, although you've got a history with it. It was absolutely petrifying. Um, and although I had a history with books, I had absolutely no uh, history with selling books. Um, and so I took a lot of advice from the publishers I think it was a great advantage for me that I, I had relationships with people in the publishing industry already because I had been in the industry itself and I obviously had worked a lot with them on Books for Jenny's show. Um, so they were very kind to me. Um, they gave me proper discounts instead of sort of not really proper discounts, <laughs> which yeah. is very important for a startup business. Yeah. Um, and they, they helped me put a list together as well. Um, of, of books that, that I should have in the shop. Obviously based on sales, based on the area that I was in, and based on what they, they have these things called core titles. And obviously not every, core ti not every shop has the same core titles, but some titles just go in all shops. Yeah. Um, and those were things I didn't know. And wow. I have to say they were amazing. They were incredibly helpful. And I drew uh, on a lot of people in the industry for advice, with spending, with... Um, you know, what kind of discounts I should be looking for. Um, wow. So every step got you closer to love books. Every single step did. Yeah. Yeah. So you started out petrified. How scared are you now of the, of the book business? Have you, have you wrestled it? Uh, do you own it? Are you still a little bit scared <laughs> no, sometimes? No. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, there's bigs up and down in any retail, I think, yeah. not just in books. Um, and since we've been open, I mean, I remember the day that I decided, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to open this bookshop. We're going to sign the lease. Um, driving home on the news was, it was 2007, I think, or 2008. No, 2009, sorry. We were in, our, in an official recession. Um, and I thought, I oh wanted my to God, get to that, yeah. what have I done? Anyway, we carried on. And we opened in the June of that year. And I think in about the, and at that time, uh, digital books, downloading, all mm, of that Kindles. was, it was a very distant thing. Mm. I, I don't think Kindle was even invented. Maybe it was, but it, it was so yeah. distant. It, it, the book industry still felt like it did before the digital yeah. thing came along. Before so, audio I mean, books and yeah, everything else. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I was pretty naive, I suppose. Um, and it was in about the April of that year that I thought, my God, here comes the digital revolution. And, every, and it how was, is this going to impact my yes. business? Yeah. Because at that time, it had impacted on the music industry very negatively. Yeah. And everybody was waiting for exactly what happened to the music industry to happen to the book industry. But you remember there was that conversation that here comes, yep. the, here comes the killer of small bookstores. Absolutely. Independent bookstores. And, not and only even of, for the big ones too. Yeah, not yeah. only of independent bookstores, but, but of The books. industry, yeah. Everybody was talking about the death of books. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and did you find, as somebody who was working on radio, that that narrative definitely didn't help? Because we still perpetuate this narrative that I think is, is horribly wrong, that people don't read. If a Jacques Po uh, book is anything, the fact that you had um, uh, exclusive book CEO yesterday talk about ordering 50,000 of my president's keeper, um, it kind of tells you that people are reading, but why do you think, as somebody who's got a bit of background in media, we keep on perpetuating this narrative that people don't read? I think part of the problem is people don't publish properly. Um, there's a whole market out there that has been neglected. Um, I think people are getting into it now. There's more publishing, especially in the children's mm -hmm. area, which is important in, in ele all 11 languages, from far more publishers instead of these little little publishers that are prepared to take the risks. Mm. Um, and there's far more publishing in you know to those wider markets, mm. uh, cheaper publishing, better distribution, that kind of thing. It's in the early stages still, I think, um, and I, I don't think I know enough about it either, really. But it's we're just getting better at it. Mm. I mean, this year I've seen a huge shift in 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 publishing. 
there's, you know, that I think my biggest sellers this year, off the top of my head, have been the Pumla Danao Goba books, Reflecting mm-hmm. Rogue, and the Sasonki Um Simangs, Always Another Country. And there's a huge uh, market out there for that kind of writing, which we've only really just started yeah. to investigate. A couple of years ago, you would have struggled yep. to, sell, the, to yeah. sell those books. Yeah, yeah. And I think, yeah, reading... It's a tricky one. I think a lot about reading is not cool if you're in the teenage <laughs> thing. Okay. I know because I have a daughter who is a, a reader of note. That's yeah. all she wants to do with her life. <laughs> She's but, she has the, but she has a livable example of – she yeah. grew up with somebody who yeah. loves books. Yeah. I, don't, yeah. it's, I think you can't teach that to somebody who, who grew up with parents who didn't read. It's who, not a thing who who that happens of, on its own. Who sat in front of a TV. It just doesn't work. Absolutely not at all. I think it's absolutely critical that you have books in your house and that you read to your children every single night. I promise you, if you read to your child every single night before they go to bed, they will read. And even if they move away from it, they will come back to it. Hmm. Or they will understand the importance of words, the importance of the journeys you can take Hmm. in books, whether they are serious philosophical questioning journeys or whether they're just pure escapism and fun. Hmm. Um, But all of those enriching things, they will understand if you read to them. And as well chronicled, uh, Eusebius Makaiser talks about the power of books. It it took him out of his situation of poverty. And he's a world-class broadcaster today. He's traveled the world. He studied at multiple universities. And that's the power of books. We're going to take an ad break. When we come back, uh, we'll touch a little bit on uh, what um, what Kate was talking about. I don't know why I'm thinking of Susan. Uh, What Kate was talking about, uh, starting a business in a recession, talking about potential trends and the kind of books we need to look out for. Let's take an ad break. Brandlive.co.za Have you ever thought about the power of social media? Social media has the power to make your business grow. Grow! Why don't you let us manage your social media? Because our business is to see your business grow. Visit us at www.beastownmedia.co.za You're listening to brandlive.co.za, an industry first in the world of internet radio. Not only are we an internet radio station, we're an internet radio platform for your brand. So why not expose your brand to potentially thousands of listeners and improve your customer relationships and brand equity with podcasts and live broadcasts? Be sure to check brandlive.co.za for more information. Brandlive.co.za, harnessing the power of internet radio. You're listening to brandlive.co.za. You're back with The Weekly with me, Sam Marshall. And uh, today we are talking to a celeb. Um, of books, she keeps on saying no. I'm um, talking, of course, of Kate Rogan, who owns uh, Love Books in Melville. Uh, I was fortunate enough last week for the very, very first time after driving past that shop for years uh, to be inside and uh, having a conversation with Consuelo Rowland about her book called uh, The Wolf Trap. And I really wanted to understand what drives somebody to be the keeper of books. Because I think it's in every, in, in, in every industry, it's interesting. But to find somebody who has found a passion for it, a love for it, and could be, let's be honest, there are easier ways of making money, right? There are. It's love and it's passion. Nobody in the book industry makes a lot of money. Everybody does it for love. And that's why it's such a fantastic industry to be in it. Because whatever, wherever you are in it, it's people are in it for the passion. Because they love books, because they believe in reading, and because they want to spread the word. They mm. want people to read. Kate, do you come from a generation of, of business owners? Or was this the, the, <laughs> are you the first one to really venture into entrepreneurship? I think I am, yeah. No one's ever asked me that. I've never even thought about it. No, my dad's an accountant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and my so, mom looked after her children. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, you know, the, the biggest problem with people that love us and our friends, that they want to protect us, even when we don't want them to protect. What was the, the worst advice if you had to follow it? You probably wouldn't have owned love books today. People were saying, don't open it. It's a recession. Come on, think about it. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the the publishers of one of the the bigger publishing houses, who is a friend of mine, uh, uh, came around and we had a glass of champagne and she said to me, Kate, you know, quite honestly, you'd be crazy. Mm. And why I ignored her, I don't know. I think it was just, it was an exciting thing for me to do at the time. Um, 
we had the, the sort of seed capital and I wanted to go for it. And I believed in it. And I, I really love books. I love them. Mm. I love ordering them. I love putting them up in my shop. And you love the smell of books. I love the smell of them. I remember when we first opened after stocking that shop on that Sunday, and I think we opened on a Monday or whatever it was, and somebody came in to buy a book. And I thought, but you can't have that. It looks beautiful there. It's on display. I've spent hours choosing it. <laughs> and the aim of the shop is to sell. Yeah, but I've come a long way since then, so no, I promise sure. you. No, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, the industry. The industry... Forget a technical recession, but the industry has had its ups and downs. It's um, a little bit earlier we talked about this perpetuated myth that people don't read. How have you managed to survive the ups and downs in the industry? Uh, I know you said some months we break mm. even, other months we do really, mm. really well. But there must be a formula that you tap into that maybe other people uh, just haven't gotten right. I don't know. It does. I mean, I do feel sometimes it's kind of hand to mouth. I do it month to month. Um, I suppose some years you decide, okay, this is going to be the tricky thing this year. Um, it's either the dollar rand exchange that when the rand went right out of control was a very scary time. I must say, you know, a trade paperback, a hardback was going over 500 rand. Wow. It was very, very tricky. Um, and, you know, so you cut back on stock. You cut back on orders that you would have normally placed. Um the Eskom thing was a big worry at one stage. I mean, we had a couple of yeah. launches in the dark, but then I got used to <laughs> launching in the dark. <laughs> and <laughs> it's never nice for an author, yeah. I promise you. Yeah. But I've got a box of, of rechargeable lights. So oh, we, yeah. you can see your paper, we can so shine you become on. innovative yeah, around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know how we've managed to kind of push through every every month. Um you know, I suppose it's it's also taken me. It's a learning process, yeah. owning a business. You know, it's you learn what your what your market really wants. You learn where you can step out. You learn where you can say, okay, instead of ordering one, because I normally order ones and twos of things. I mean, I, I order slowly. I can't order piles like they do yeah. in, in the big bookshops um, because I have cash flow that I have to manage all the time, and I, I do manage that quite closely. So, you know, Jacques' book, for example, I ordered four. Would you believe it? Uh, and you've sold all four? <laughs> no, yeah, I've ordered four, but I very quickly ordered another 20 when I found out what it was because it was under such a strict embargo that I didn't even know what I was ordering. So I thought, well, what if I'm ordering a dud? You know, I really don't yeah. want to do that. So I was, I, I probably am quite cautious. Um, you know, something yeah. interesting you mentioned, ordering duds. Um, have you developed a sense for not ordering a dud? Have you worked out, have you kind of... I know it comes with time and practice and you've done it so many times that something can tell you whether it works or not. Mm. And have you been, when have you been right and when have you been wrong? I think I've got better at that. Um, but I still make mistakes. Um, I, I don't know about when I've been right and when I've been wrong. I can't really think right now, except for what's in the shop at the moment. Yeah. Uh, there's a book, uh, which is a wonderful book in the shop at the moment, called A um, Hundred Objects of the Boer War. You might not think that's too wonderful, but were, it's based on an idea which was called A Hundred Objects, I think, of the of World War One, mm. and they are fantastic books. They take photographs of things like helmets, and then they go behind that and they tell the story of the soldier oh. who wore that helmet and why it's got a ding on the right hand side or whatever it is. Oh. And they they've done that with the the Boer War book, and I think it's a fantastic Christmas present. <laughs> wow. But um, I'm not selling it as easily as I had hoped I would. Um, but I, I have, I've got better at that, definitely. Yeah. And I, I'm taking more risks. I mean, this year, I have to say, it's been fantastic. Well, because um, you've, there's more risk-taking, but it's calculated. More risk-taking, more, uh, yeah, I'm obviously better at it because I've I've sold, except for the Boer War one, I, I've kind of hit it right. Wow. Um, and it's been great. It's been a lot of local stuff. The Sasonki M. Simang Kwezi, Reedy's book. Yeah. Um, really Pumla's book, book wow. yeah. Hmm. The Pumla Danaya Goba. Talk to me about that shift in... In the sales demographic, and I don't know what it was when you started out and where it sits now, but if you're talking about um, guys like Crazy's book uh, that really wrote uh, Pumla and all those, was it has it always been this demographic, or has it slowly shifted in terms of the kind of content that you've purchased Definitely. and the fact that uh, we seem to be a little bit more patriotic around local authors? Yeah. 
I think, I mean, local sales have always been good for local bookshops okay. and local nonfiction sales. So there's always been an interest in current affairs and nonfiction locally. That's always your stronger areas, mm. whichever bookshop you're in, really. Except funnily enough, for me, I, I've, I sell a lot of fiction, both local fiction and um, international fiction, which is fantastic. Uh, Aaron Dutty Roy's new book this year, The Ministry of... Um, Happiness, mm. the, of utmost happiness, has been absolutely fantastic for me. Sheila was the author of The God of Small Things, which was fantastic. And people have been anticipating this book. And uh, yeah, we've just, we're constantly selling it. I've sold, it's been one of my fastest sellers ever. Um, but I think that along with the, the publishing industry tapping into these mm. other stories that are there, and probably also with the increasing dissatisfaction with our government. Mm. There are a lot more stories coming out and there are a lot more people that want to read them. We're not necessarily as polarized as we were, mm. I feel. So, yeah, and I, I suppose it's just a uh, middle class uh, market growing. Yeah, yeah. There's and been a rise. Into, uh, yeah. What they, uh, they yeah. define as black diamonds. And yeah. That, um, that black middle class. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we talked about but the industry and we talked about trends and we talked about um, some of the, the new books. But personally, have you ever been, uh, what is the book that has gotten you the most excited to host at one of the launches that you were a fan of? Because I can only imagine that doing so many book launches, you know, with all due respect, you try and be there 100% for each of them. But some are a little bit more exciting than others. Um. I have to say I was very excited for the Sasonki book, Always Another Country. I don't know if you've read it. No, I haven't. It's a, she calls it a memoir of exile and belonging, I think. But I've heard the um, interview on 702 with Eusebius. Yeah. Yeah. And I just think that, I don't know, she took me to places in that book that I've, I've never been to. I've never read a story like that from a person who has grown up as a South African in exile. And it was a fascinating journey for me. And she's a beautiful writer. And she speaks about things like, you know, living in Emerentia, mm. on the Emerentia Ridge, and trying to to sort of make peace and come to terms with this whiteness and clipping her hedges. And for me, it was such an interesting book. And I, I, I really related to her. Like, it, she, it didn't seem like something so foreign to me, which mm. was also interesting for me. So I, I was very looking forward to to that launch. Launch, and, and did it live up? Did it live up? It, to it? it completely did. Sasonki lived up to it, yeah. And I think okay. people loved it. I'd like to mention another one, which was a while ago, because it was such a big international hit. It's also a work of nonfiction, actually. Um, it was H's for Hawk by uh, an author called Helen MacDonald. I don't know if you know it, but she wrote about it's her. She's a British writer. And she writes about um, this relationship she has with a hawk, but it's all um, to do with the death of her father and mm. coming to terms with the death of her father. So it's grief and it's, it's finding ways through that grief, but it is the most extraordinary book. It is beautiful, beautiful writing, and it is an extraordinary read, even though it is set in the green fields of England, <laughs> to mm. which we don't really have such a – we don't relate. Um and having her in the shop was a very, very exciting thing That was a groupy moment for you. It was a groupy moment, yeah. And we also had Paul Beatty this year, who's the winner yeah. of the Man Booker Prize. That was a groupy moment. Um, I'm not going to ask you to mention names, but have you had horrible um, book launches? Yes, we have. Yes. <laughs> We're going to leave it's it It's when that. people don't come <laughs> or when it's just boring or yeah. um, when the author just doesn't live up to expectations or there, there's something lacking there's just a lack of integrity you yeah. feel okay this book is not really what it says it is i get the sense that and i know it must be very difficult as a book owner because you're dealing with so many different facets of this business and it could be quite naive to think you're only ordering books and that's what you do the whole day but there's a lot of elements to it do you get a chance to read every book that comes into the store? Oh, I wish I could say yes. So. <laughs> Absolutely not at all. <laughs> I don't. Um, so I, I skim a lot. I sort of get a feel for a lot. Um, but when I'm ordering, I order based on what I know. And I do know a fair amount about the industry, what our market wants to read, who mm. writers are. Um, so, you know, I, I, I would order a writer that I love, not necessarily having read the book, obviously. Mm. And I would sell it on that basis. Um, but there's too many books coming through my shop. I mean, I would be 
It's impossible. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's what I was thinking. Because <laughs> no, you, you, you speak so eloquently about some of the books. I thought, you know, it's not possible for you to read all the books. No. But there's a certain books you have to make the time for. Yeah, there are How, certain books. Where do you think. find the time to read a book, by the way? Uh, you, you know what? It's You can get reading fit. It's like running a marathon. You can uh, train for okay, it. Okay, reading fit. I yeah, love that. That's yeah, great. Yeah. Reading fit. So you can make yourself sit down for an hour every day and read. Okay. And then when you have that hour to get properly absorbed in a book and to properly feel what you're reading, then you want to do it again. And it's it sort of, it builds momentum. Is love, books, fitness. Is love book successful? Yeah. Would you define I it as successful? Um, financially, um, it's not, you know, we, we pay our way. It's nothing really more than that. <laughs> okay. But that's okay. Uh, we employ people and we keep a lot of people happy with our launches and our books. Um, but I think it is a successful business. Absolutely. Um, mm. I think we punch way above our weight. That's lovely. Yeah. So you talked about your, your, your daughter, who's this avid reader and uh, who's got this uh, relationship with books. How does the family feel now, eight years down the line, with love books and do you, as a book uh, store owner, have to curtail yourself and say, well, it works here, maybe it could work somewhere else? Should we franchise? No, we shouldn't franchise. <laughs> it's too hard, Sam. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, I, I don't think we should. No, it's I, I've had offers, you know, people build shopping centers and they want a lovely bookshop in there and that kind of thing comes my way quite a bit. But no, one shop is enough for me. I'd be I'd be very nervous of another shop. Um <laughs> From a time point of view, yeah. and it's also the and input from me. You know, yeah, the personal yeah, yes. thing is so important. Me yeah. and Anna, who manages the shop, yeah. it's so important that. And, yeah. you know, that standing back from it would be scary for me. But it, it, one shop allows you to have a life. Yeah. Two shops, you wouldn't know. Yeah. It's also shops, bookshops, my bookshop at any rate. It's, it's built up momentum. I yeah. think businesses build up momentum. And yeah. it takes time. Yeah. And, um, no, so, not for so, me. So, okay, I've got to ask you this final question. So project love books in another 8, 20 years from now. What will it look like? Will it look the same? Will it feel the same with the advancement of technology? How do you incorporate new technologies in your business? What would love books look like? Yo, I don't know. I live day by day, <laughs> month by month. <laughs> okay. Um, I would like to keep it what it is. I mean, because it's when, authentic at yeah, the moment. When digital started coming in and Kindle started coming in, I agonized about how do we do this without money? Because we don't have capital to buy computers and make little stations and do all that kind of mm. thing. It's just not, I don't have that kind of money. Um, but it's good that I never did anything. And it's because I don't need to now. The shop doesn't need it. Mm. In 10 years' time, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, if you've read internationally, book sales are now outstripping digital sales. Mm. In, and I, I think the whole digital death of books freak out has settled down. And the dust settled on that, mm. I would say, last year. We can now happily go along. We can sell books and you can read on Kindle. And I can do both. You can do both. My customers can do both. Mm. Uh, as long as we can keep books going. I mean, I was thinking about it this morning because the Jacques Poe frenzy, everybody wants the President's Keepers and nobody's got any books. You can go and download it. You can buy an ebook. Yeah. But I but it's just not the, the same. The whole morning, I have been fielding calls from people wanting that book. The yeah. whole morning. So when will you have some more in stock? We've been told delivery mid-November. Wow. I don't know. I can't say for sure. I'm hoping they're right. going to really push it out. But more important, we're happy for Jacques because it means a local author can at least make it's some fantastic. money because he gets a small portion of that book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the publishers can make it. It's good for everybody. That's a good thing about books. It's always good for everybody when you sell a book. It's good for the store. It's good for the author. It's good for the publisher. And it's good for you as well. Kate, where can people log in to find out more about uh, books, uh, suggestions on books, that kind of stuff? Uh, we've got a, a website, which is lovebooks.co.za, but I'm most active on Facebook, uh, Love Books Josie, and Twitter, at Love Books Josie. Kate Rogan, it's a pleasure to have you in studio. Thank it's the you, owner of Love Books here in Melville. If you've never been to it, Google the details, find out more. They've got launches between Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, most weeks, and uh, it's an experience to be that close to an author. So go and check it out. Thank you for listening. Brandlive.co.za Harnessing the power of talk radio. 
brandlive.co.za. Oh,